Welcome to Good God, conversations that matter about faith and public life. I'm your host, George Mason, and I'm delighted to welcome to the program today my friend, Imam Omar Suleiman. Thank you, great to be with you again. So happy for you to be here. He is the president and actually founder of the Yaqeen Institute, uh, which is a uh, really an educational organization to uh, help people uh, deepen their understanding of Islam, and uh, you are the resident teacher, I guess. Is, is that right? Yes, I am. So it's been a blessing. We're we're almost three years old now, and um, it's been a blessing. You know, to to it really covers uh, issues that are deep with Islam and Muslim identity formation, and how that I, I interacts with the modern world. So. Well, one of the things I love about you is that you not only care about the formation of your own community around. Uh, its beliefs and deepening its understanding, which is is part of what the institute does. But you also interact more broadly in the community, and that means also uh, helping people understand better your own faith tradition. Uh, right. And so, in this particular episode, I'd love for us to do some things, Omar, that I think uh, would help people. Uh, as you know, you run up against this every day of your life. That. Islam in the West is a strange sort of um, religion to people. There's a, a kind of um, eccentricity to it because it didn't originate in the West. And so I think it's really important, not that our faith that did, right? right? <laughs> this is something I think we need to realize. Yes. <laughs> uh, all of these faiths come out of uh, the Middle East. Uh, but I think it would be really helpful if we went through some just really basic things and helped dispel some misconceptions sure, and, sure. and gain some clarity and those sorts of things. Sure. So uh, would you mind just like, let's just hit a few things quickly. So uh, the Prophet Muhammad and the year was uh, when he received his revelation and what were the circumstances yes. of uh, the birth of Islam? So I'm actually glad you frame it that way. And first of all, just uh, thank you for your friendship. Thank you for the incredible human being that you are and what you've done for the city of Dallas and how yeah. you've made it such a place for me and my family to settle. So and, thank and you, your Will. friendship is just it's thank you, I think, I think for, for everything that you do uh, for us. So you're welcome. Uh, I do want to kind of get that out of the way. And <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you're welcome. So, so it's, it's an honor. Thank it you. really is and, mutual. Um, I'd like to also, I think, I think sort of the framing is very appropriate because uh, Islam is sort of looked at as foreign. Yes. Whereas uh, Christianity and, and you know Judaism is also anti-Semitism, of course, is on the rise again, and Judaism yes. is, of course, also some, somehow looked at as foreign, but less so than Islam, right? Because right. Islam right. has a very Arab yes. uh, look to it, even though less than twenty percent of Muslims around the world are Arab. Um, so it's uh, isn't that okay? Say that one more time. <laughs> sure. It's very important to hear this. Yes, less than twenty percent of Muslims. It's actually around fifteen percent of Muslims are Arab yes. worldwide, globally. Uh, the largest, uh, uh, ma the largest group of Muslims in the United States are African American. Yes. So the f the 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 foreignness of Islam and, and and the casting of Muslims as a as a foreign community is sort of part of an Orientalist project, and uh. it's we're not the only victims of that as a faith community. Right. Right. To be otherized. Right. And so yes. any Hollywood iteration yes. of Islam uh, is typically going to be a guy with a turban. Right. In the deserts of Yemen, or uh, in in a, in, a, in a movie that glorifies a war on Iraq, and a guy yes. running around as a terrorist screaming "Allahu Akbar," right? Um, you know, doing something horrible and awful. So that's yes. the otherizing uh, is definitely malicious. Yes. Now the framing is important from a historical perspective as well because uh, Islam is an Abrahamic faith, uh, both mm -hmm. in creed and in ritual. Yes. And I think it's important uh, to to sort of take it from there. Uh, the word Islam uh, means peace attained through submission. So it yes. means submission and peace. Mm -hmm. And so particularly peace on an individual level that is attained through submitting to God and uh, submitting as a community to God and attaining peace in the collective sense. Okay. And in our conception uh, of, of creed, uh, all of the prophets that are mentioned in the Old Testament would be considered Muslim because they submitted to God and they attained peace. Not yes. necessarily adherents of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, but they certainly uh, upheld a creed of monotheism and submitted to God's will. I think we could all agree on that yes. part. You know? okay. So uh, the way that Islam comes about in the world is uh, the Prophet Muhammad uh, uh, was born in, uh, in, in the year 570. Mm -hmm. He receives revelation in the year 610 uh, from the angel Gabriel with a new revelation. Now, uh, Christianity and Judaism 
uh, as faith communities, Christians and Jews, are not far far from where that's happening in Mecca. There was yes. no Saudi Arabia in the year 610. Right. <laughs> Saudi right. Arabia is a, a new nation state Yes, um, that, that's uh, named after a family and named after a tribe. And uh, mm -hmm. so it, it, had, it didn't exist at that time. Mm -hmm. It was just the Gulf, the Arabian Gulf. Right. And there's a lot of debate happening with the person of Jesus, peace be upon him as well, right? You know, the Council of Nicaea is in the fourth century. Yes. Uh, the first Bibles, there was in fact no Arabic Bible at the time right. uh, that existed in the, in, in the, in the early uh, seventh right. century or in the late sixth century. And so there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot that's happening in that region at the time, right? Mm -hmm. There's the Jewish community and of course uh, Christianity as a faith community coming into its own, mm -hmm. the Council of Nic Nicaea, the Eastern and Western Christian yes. uh, uh, split. And now you have this new faith community. Now, geographically speaking, everything that was taking place in that re region was framed in the Roman and Persian conflict. Okay. And the Romans identify with Christianity. Mm -hmm. broad, in the broad sense, they're monotheists, right? And in the specific sense, they're a Christian faith community. Yes. In the political sense, they're Roman. Yes. The Persians identify with Zoroastrianism. Yes. And they are politically, of course, uh, you know, uh, an empire that is up against the Roman Empire. And yes. the, 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 the Arabs were kind of observers in this whole thing. Okay. So they're watching the Romans, they're watching the Persians, and everyone is either a client state, mm -hmm. a client kingdom, or is an observer of this. Mm -hmm. Now, the Arabs were, at that time, they, they, they worshipped multiple idols. Mm -hmm. So they had idols uh, that they would uh, set up for different tribes. And uh, mm -hmm. in fact, the, the Holy Kaaba, which we believe was built by Abraham, peace be upon him, mm -hmm. uh, as a place of monotheism, mm -hmm. was surrounded by idols and it was turned into a place of many idols. The mm -hmm. Arabs allied themselves both politically and religiously with the Persians. Mm -hmm. So I'm giving you this history because it gets interesting. really interesting here because then when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, makes his call, uh, he calls as an extension of the Abrahamic way. Mm -hmm. So he's calling to the original way of Abraham, peace be upon him. So mm -hmm. they said, this house was built by Abraham for the worship of one God. Yes. He's calling as an extension of, uh, of, of the message of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. So of course, Islam looks at Jesus, peace be upon him, as a prophet and a messenger of God. Mm -hmm. um, but within the, within uh, more, you know, from a creedal sense, Islam and Judaism are very similar. Yes. Uh, and so. More strict monotheists. Correct. Than you would say Christians are. Yes. Because of our notion of the Trinity. Yes. Right. But here's where it gets interesting now. So. The prophet, peace be upon him, calls to monotheism. He calls to the return to the Abrahamic way. Uh, Christianity was not as known to the Arabs in Mecca as it was as Judaism was, because okay. there was a Jewish community in the nearby town of Yathrib. Mm -hmm. um, there were Jewish tribes that settled there. Now, when he makes this call for the oneness of God, he also calls for a lot of the things that made Jesus, peace be upon him, unpopular in the political and social realm. So hmm. he calls for an end to corruption. He calls for an end to, at that time, the Arabs specifically practiced female infanticide. They practiced all sorts of horrific tribal corruption. And mm -hmm. the uh, religion that was, uh, that was accommodating, it was a very loose way of thinking that accommodated the idols, was really used to uh, entrench certain tribes with their superiority over others. So we have this idol because we belong here. We get this proximity to the house of God. Yes. So a lot of the, the social equity and the political equity uh, that Jesus, peace be upon him, called for, along with his, with, with his, with his divine call, was mm -hmm. similar in what the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, called for. So that made him very unpopular. Immediately faced persecution. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's the case for all of these people of God that when they initially yes. come with their call, they're not just talking about a challenge to the theology, but they're talking about really a challenge to the entire way of life right. as it exists in that society. So what do the Muslims do, the early Muslims do? They ally themselves with the Christians. Mm -hmm. the, very first, um, the very first migration of Muslims fleeing persecution was to Abyssinia, to a Christian king, modern day Ethiopia. Wow, Ethiopia, right. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, sends, including his daughter, I mean his closest companions, mm -hmm. his daughter, mm -hmm. and he says there's a just Christian king there hmm. uh, the, uh, named Najashi. In Arabic it's Najashi, in English the Negus. And his name is Ashama in Arabic, and, and the, the Ashama king. He said he's a just king. He didn't know him personally, but he said he's a just man and he will not turn you away. Wow. So he sends his followers to Abyssinia and Abyssinia was known as a, an island of monotheism in a sea of polytheism because it's surrounded by Persian territory, right. but it's a, a small Christian kingdom. Interesting. And Najashi accepts these Muslims um, and 
then you have the second migration, which is to Yathrib, which becomes now Medina, the city of the Prophet mm -hmm. Muhammad, peace be upon him. Mm -hmm. And the Muslims and Jews form what is known to many historians as the first constitution in the world. They form the Charter of Medina, where the faith communities yes. come together, mm -hmm. and they form an agreement amongst themselves about how they will protect one another, mm -hmm. how they will embrace the pluralism that now exists in the city of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And there is a chapter in the Quran called Rome. Hmm. Uh, uh, and the chapter of Rome talks about the Romans and the Persians. And the uh, Arab polytheists were taunting the Arab Muslims and saying that just as the Persian polytheists are destroying the Roman monotheists, we too will destroy you. Mm -hmm. And so there is a turn. In the same year that the Muslims flee persecution from Mecca to Yathrib, where they're welcomed and it becomes the city of the Prophet Medina, uh, that same year where the Muslims attain their victory, the Roman Empire uh, sort of rebounds against the Persian Empire. Now that's not to say the Roman Empire was great. It's yeah. not great. Right. That's to say that there was a natural inclination. The Muslims sort of connected themselves naturally to the monotheists that they knew. Mm -hmm. um, and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, framed his call as an extension of the Abrahamic call. So let's, let's just pause there for a moment and and reflect upon the idea that we have three major religions that trace their lineage to Abraham. Yes. Uh, we, we call them the Abrahamic religions, but in each case, the birth of these religions springs forth from a sense of uh, moral and cultural and political crisis of some sort. Correct. So in every case, what we have is a kind of, uh, of, of sense of inbreaking of God. The world is not as God has intended it to be. Uh, there is oppression of one people over another, one culture over another. There is a kind of spiritual um, misplaced values with multiple gods and an enfranchising of uh, of one tribe over another and these sorts of things. And so each of these inbreakings is a kind of, uh, a, of reformation, uh, of kind of a purification, an right. anti-corruption movement. Each of these cases is a, a kind of democratizing of faith, if you will, too, because it creates a kind of equality among people. So we, before, we, before we sort of indict uh, Christianity or Islam as as creating more oppression, we should we should recognize that initially, at least, right, the 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 actual point of these uh, the birth of these religions was to address that very problem and right. to correct it. So it's really interesting, you know, as you were saying that the, the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him. When I say any name of any prophet. Yes. As a Muslim, it's tradition to say, peace be upon him. Yes. So if I say Jesus' name, we say, peace be upon him. If right. I say Abraham's name, we say, peace be upon him. Uh, it's required for us to say it the first time, and it's liked for us to say it every other time in a I conversation. See. Interesting. Yeah, so that's sort of our jurisprudence Okay, thank you for clarifying for, <laughs> yes, for folks. Yeah. Because sometimes people are like, I got to tell you a funny story, but I don't want to lose my point on that. Okay, <laughs> but, uh, right. We, uh, you know, he said, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that God looked at the world before he sent him. And... Uh, he was displeased with the state of the world, the yes. Arabs and the non-Arabs, except for a small portion of the people of the book. The people of the book are the Jews and the Christians yes. in Islamic tradition. That's actually the name given to Jews and Christians yes. in the Quran is the right. people of the book. So God was displeased with what he saw in the world except for what a small group of, of Jews and Christians were practicing mm. of pure monotheism with its implications of a pure society or, or, or pure mm -hmm. practice. And so the idea of removing the other, you know, Islam is a monotheistic faith, right? And, it's, and, and definitely the idea is that all of these prophets call to the oneness of God, but the implications of the oneness of God had major ramifications, and that naturally made them prone to being persecuted because that yes. threatened the elite class's hold on society and exactly. what they were able to do with the idols. Right. And so the, the, when, when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, started this call, the, uh, what, the, what the ruling tribes said to him is they said, listen, they said, we'll come to a compromise. They said, how about, you know, you worship your God one day. We'll, we'll all worship your God one day, and you worship our idols one day. And he said, no. And he was in a state of weakness. They said, well, uh, you know, we'll worship your God, the one God, for six days. You worship our idols for one. And he said, no. And then they finally got to, we'll worship your God the whole year, 
but you just got to worship the idols for one day. Their idea was not, they didn't really have a care for the, the idols themselves. It was what the idols gave them access right, to do exactly. and, the, and the power right. that it gave them mm -hmm. um, to, uh, to take advantage of people and to oppress. Right. And my funny story, I, I just have to share it. I was in a... Hold, hold that okay, point. Sorry, We're going to come sure. back from the break. <laughs> okay, got and, it. And, I, and we'll let you tell it. And All then right, I, also want it. Us to, I also want us to move into some uh, understanding of scripture and tradition yes, and how it's interpreted please. within Absolutely. Islam as well. Absolutely. So Thank uh, you. just take a break. Right. Okay. Thank you for continuing to tune in to Good God. These conversations are part of a larger program that is called Faith Commons, the umbrella organization, you might say, of Good God. Good God is the first project of Faith Commons, which is a nonprofit organization that is intended to do public theology, you might say. Uh, it's multi-faith, not just Christian, Jewish, Muslim, other faiths, but all of them becoming involved in the question of how do we promote the common good together. There are so many areas of need and concern in our community, and Faith Commons is trying to help bridge the gaps uh, between religions and peoples in our community so that we can have a more just and peaceful society. Thanks for continuing to support us. We're back with Omar Solomon, and he uh, was just about to tell us something funny. Yes. So. <laughs> so my funny story is that I wrote a paper on Jesus, peace be upon him, Islam and Christianity in high school. Uh -huh. Which was in New Orleans, by the way, yes, right? From yes, from New Orleans. I yeah. think we should we all stop and say for a moment that you, you are a, an American born in this country and Palestinian parents, yes. uh, but uh, they, they had immigrated to the U.S. and so you were born in New Orleans yes. and this is a paper in high school. Absolutely. So uh, I'm in Louisiana. I am, at that time, actually, I was in Baton Rouge at that point now still in Louisiana, and I was writing this paper on Jesus, peace be upon him, and Islam and Christianity. Now, Muslims will typically put PBUH yes. behind the name of any prophet. Right. Uh, peace so be upon him. Peace be upon him. I made the assumption that my teacher would know what that means. Uh, uh -huh. So I wrote Jesus and Christianity and Islam, and I kind of just compared and contrasted, and I wrote PBUH. And she came up to me with her face extremely red, and she said, you can't do that. I said, what? She said, you can't say Jesus. Oh, no. <laughs> so As she, if you were scorning. Yes. yes. Jesus. Oh, my she goodness. She read the first line and she said, Okay, but see, this is, but so. this is exactly to the point of yes. why we need these conversations, yes. right? Why we need the interaction. Because misunderstandings come from yes. ignorance. And Correct. ignorance is not always willful. Uh, Correct. So there, there are many people who really do want to understand. And oh, yeah. so that's, that's what we're after here. So well, if you follow me on Facebook, though, now, or on social media, and you say to me, write PBUH, you know I'm not scorning. I'm Thank just saying you. peace yes. beyond. Well, him, we so. also know you, and we know you wouldn't be scorning. So very good. Well, let's, let's talk about Scripture. Because yes. um, obviously, Jews have the Hebrew Bible, and Christians have the New Testament Scriptures and the Hebrew Bible that we call the Old Testament. And so that's, uh, th those are our Scriptures. Islam actually respects those scriptures as well, but the Quran is your holy text. Correct. Yes. So, so, so to kind of give you the underlying, so there are, the easiest way to know Islam, in like, if I could give it Islam in, in, in a minute, it's there are six pillars of faith, belief in God, belief in the angels, Gabriel, Michael, and some of the other angels mm -hmm. that are very mm -hmm. familiar. Uh, belief in the prophets and messengers, mm -hmm. belief in the messages, so the, the divine scriptures that came to those prophets and messengers. So pretty much any prophet you mentioned from the mm -hmm. Old Testament, okay. Moses, peace be upon him, is actually the most spoken about prophet in the Quran. Okay. Um, Abraham, peace be upon him, is looked at as, our, as the father, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, Noah, peace be upon him. Uh, all of them are mentioned, and Jesus, peace be upon him, is mentioned by name even more than Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the Quran. Interesting. He's mentioned uh, 25 times, the mm -hmm. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his name is mentioned five times in the Quran. Yes. Uh, and then so you got God, the angels, the messengers, the messages they received, the day of judgment, mm -hmm. and, it, and, 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 you know, paradise and, and hellfire, mm -hmm. and the divine decree, mm -hmm. predestination divine decree okay. as a six. So those are six pillars, mm -hmm. kind of underlines the creed. So these prophets and messengers all received divine scripture, mm -hmm. divine revelation. Yes. Now, obviously, there are historical changes, there are versions, there are languages, sure. there are translations. So the idea is that the originals were 
entirely from God and then over time what, what exists in all divine scripture. In the Islamic conception is partly there could be parts and there are parts that are from God. So there's the, the respect that should be given to religious tradition in general. So even if there is a, a community, a faith community or a religious scripture that we don't acknowledge within the Abrahamic framework at all, we would still treat it with respect and yeah. we treat the people with respect because mm -hmm. they should be respected and they're people of faith and mm -hmm. their, their, their books should be respected and treated mm -hmm. that way. But what makes the, the, the Bible very interesting is that we do believe that uh, there is some of God's word that exists in it. And so as Muslims, it's upheld to, a, to that standard, right? Now the Quran, uh, the, uh, there's, there's a hyper sense of preservation. So the Quran is God's word. It's not, it's not inspired by God. It's not written by someone else and those people were inspired by God. It is God's word. Mm -hmm. It's God's direct revelation to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, through the angel Gabriel. So God's speaking in the Quran, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's this hyper, um, uh, I, don't, I, I say hyper, you know, and hyper could obviously give a negative connotation, but it's actually quite beautiful that uh, the, there, there's a, a, a due diligence or, or uh, added level of preservation, the idea of preserving the Quran. Yes. In, in both recitation and meaning, because it's got to be exactly mm -hmm. the same. Uh, Which is so also why to really read the Quran, you need to learn Arabic. Yes. Um, because that's how it was delivered. Yes. And there's quite a tradition of people learning uh, to recite the Quran by heart. Yes. Uh, which is really quite a challenge it, too. It is a great challenge. So the, the yes. Quran, uh, so, so 1400 years, it's, yes. this, it's only one version of it. There mm -hmm. are no versions of it. It's recited yes. in Arabic everywhere around the world. Yes. The beauty of that is if you walk into a mosque in Dallas, Texas, mm -hmm. the Imam, the person leading, who memorized the entire Quran, about 600 pages by heart, mm -hmm. uh, could be from Somalia and be, and, and be corrected in his recitation by someone from China. And we see it happen all the time. Really? And it's just beautiful to see people from all over the world okay. all reciting it in the exact same way. And they could correct every ooh and ah sound. Yes. Not just the word if it's missed. Um, but it's it's a difficult, it's one, I, I, I had the, pl the blessing of memorizing it myself. And it was, mm -hmm. it was an incredible uh, task. I mean, it's not easy to memorize it. Most people memorize it as children. And then to practice that and to continuously recite it so that you don't lose any of it is really something else. So let's talk about the... There, there's obviously a difference between Islam, Judaism, and Christianity in this respect. Yes. Because um, you you hold that uh, the Quran is the actual words of yes. God, yeah. and uh, whereas uh, both Judaism and Christianity, somewhat different ways, but nonetheless, uh, speak of these as inspired but human words. Yes. So when when we when we say the Bible is the Word of God, it is understood differently from the way Correct. the Quran is the, the Word of God. Yet my guess is that we have a similar challenge, and that is it's very, um, it, it's very easy to say something about the authority of our scripture. Yes. It's another thing to realize that when you, when you are reading and interpreting it, uh, you, you are trying not to get caught in the letter of it, but to find the m spirit of it, the meaning of it, so that it lives today. Because yes. here it's delivered 1,400 years ago, or in our case, 2,000 or 3,000 years ago, whatever. And so uh, it, it still needs to have relevance today. Correct. And therefore, there have to be interpreters of this yes. who are finding the spirit of this text. Correct. So how does that work similarly or differently because of the difference in understanding? So, uh, you know, to your point, Islam was very much so about guarding not just the text itself, but the context as much as possible. Okay. Because if you, if you take text without context, yes. you could turn Harry Potter into a violent book. You right. could turn, you yes. could do all sorts of horrific things. Yes and then do it in the name of God. Right. Which, um, which we've seen from all of our faiths. Correct. Yes. We've seen people um, have not, you know, uh, unfortunately been restricted by those original contexts and will yes. happily take verses out of context and do what they do. Right. Um, and of course, this idea of, you know, I should say from the onset, this idea of a, a, an association with the Quran with, with violence or Islam with violence, uh, the ver statistically speaking, the verses about violence. Now, we would say that 
the, the, the Quran, the New Testament, and the Old Testament, um, you know, framed in context. It, they should be understood in a certain way. But statistically speaking, the Quran has the least mentions of violence of any holy book. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea, the association is very strong. Of course. And so there's this verse, for example, which is in response to the persecution of those Muslims when they fled to Yathrib, which became Medina, the mm -hmm. city of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him where they did not take up the sword, they did not fight. Mm -hmm. For 13 years under persecution, they asked, they said, listen, uh, we'll go out at night, we'll, we'll take these people by surprise. And mm -hmm. uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said in Arabic, he said, Ma umirtu bil qatil, I was not sent to kill people, I was not sent to hurt people. Yes. He said, but I was sent as a mercy. Yes. That was his response. They get to Medina, they're chased, they're killed, even in travel, and their things are taken, their belongings are taken in Mecca, and then, even in Medina, the, the, the Muslims are saying, can we fight back now? Is there a concept of defense? Do we fight back? And that's where the verse came down. The very first verses about fighting was uh, giving permission. God has given you permission to fight while it is disliked to you. Uh -huh. So it actually starts that way. Yes. Then it says, so kill them wherever you find them. Now, yes. the way that an Islamophobe would take that is they, they take that verse and they say, the Quran says, kill them wherever you find them, i.e., in parentheses, Jews, Christians, infidels, yes. <laughs> just throw everything in there. Right. And right. then you continue with the verse and it says that, uh, that, that and if they incline towards peace, then incline towards peace, God does not love the aggressors. Ah. And there, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, commented on that and he said, uh, never wish to meet your enemy. Yes. Never wish for fighting, never wish for battle, but then there are some times, and then he said, but, but if you do, then, you know, then, then show courage and sincerity and great zeal as you fight back mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 you know, you fight under a noble cause rather than in terrorizing and, and in the vigilantism that we see today and the bigotry and, and all these things that are done in the name of, of, of sacred text. So the hadith here is where this comes into play. How did Islam try to preserve the original meaning of the Quran? There was great care given to the words of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, himself describing the verses of the Quran. And this is the hadith, the, this the is words the hadith, of the Prophet. The words yes. of the Prophet. And scrutinizing every, if someone claims that I heard the Prophet say, there's scrutiny mm -hmm. of that person's character, mm -hmm. and whether it's corroborated by other people, yes. the context of it, because right. if I say I heard him in a sermon, well, who else was in the sermon? Yes. And so it has to be corroborated, it's got to be um, you know, there's got to be a, a trustworthiness, a character mm -hmm. uh, test of the person that's, that's relaying the words. So okay. there's a chains of narration. So preserving the hadith was the first guard, and then comes scholarly authority. Which is the sunnah. Yes. yes. So the, after, after the, the, the hadith and, and then the sunnah, the person, the person of the Prophet, peace be upon him, you get to these scholars that, uh, that, that study jurists, that study the original intent, and then try to prescribe based upon that mm -hmm. uh, with modern contexts. Mm -hmm. And this is where it gets interesting. Someone asked the other day, uh, does Islam have a pope? Mm -hmm. Did it ever have a, uh, an authority like the pope? And uh, I was once asked, I was on, once on a panel about the Protestant Reformation. Mm -hmm. And this, we just marked the 500 year anniversary and like these trends did not have similar uh, um, uh, trends within the Muslim world because there's a very different understanding of religious authority historically in the Muslim world. So did we ever have a, a, an authority that was similar to the pope? And, to us, it's, uh, you know, a friend of mine said he, his name is Pope Consensus. <laughs> <laughs> Pope Consensus. Yes, yeah, so if, very good. If it's very scholars, Baptist, actually. Too, yeah, there so you go. So right. something we can, yes. we can agree very upon on that, in that regard, too. So the idea of consensus, the majority, the consensus, and then, you know, minority context should be, you should listen to the scholars that are familiar with that minority context. Okay. And then prescribe based upon that. But there's great care given to retaining the original text, the original context for the word and, and then practice of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and then scholarly authority over time, and if there was consensus on the understanding of that. Mm -hmm. So it kind of gives us a way of trying to access the original intent without being disconnected right. from modern context and losing the spirit of the original intent yes. in misunderstanding uh, uh, or in uh, wrongly prescribing that original letter and that original intent. So what you're talking about is still a living community that is in interacting with the scripture and is trying to discern yeah. uh, the mind of God over and over again the way each of our traditions is seeking to do. So we may have slightly different 
understandings of the, the origin or nature of the text itself, right. uh, but we have similar processes whereby we go about trying to discern uh, how the people of God are supposed to live. Correct. Yes. Absolutely. Very good. Well, Omar, um, there, I, we could do this all, all day, and I know the people who are listening in would like us to do it all day. Uh, in, in the last minute that we have together uh, at this time, is there something you would like to say uh, to people who are less familiar with Islam or who hear it uh, only in its characterizations by uh, media, Hollywood, um, people who are not uh, eager to embrace it, mm -hmm. uh, what are some things that you would like to say, one or two things that, that maybe you could help us? Ask a Muslim. Uh, ask a Muslim. Yeah, you okay. know, representation is not simply symbolism or tokenism. It right. is, you've got to go and have, you know, muster up the courage to ask a Muslim what okay. their faith says as opposed to let someone else characterize Very it for good. them. Very good. And the second thing, uh, there's a great book called The Abrahamic Faiths okay. by Dr. Gerald Dirks. Okay. And he does a fantastic job of, uh, he, he recently passed, and a wonderful man, uh, Harvard professor, recently, and does just a great job of sort of tracing uh, the, the line between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So I think deepening your understanding of the mm -hmm. origins is yes. just as important as um, being more open to to, to, to to broadening your scope and what's happening today and, 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 and the friction, the seeming friction between the East and the West, Muslims and Christians. Very good. And, and everything that stems from that. Well, you and I are working on a project of living in a community with one another and our faith traditions, um, not only making space for each other, but uh, finding friendship and common cause. Thank you for all of that, and Thank we look you. forward to the future together, Chuck. I appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate you having me. You bet. Me.